coming to you from the Hudson Media Group Studios. This is Talking Politics, and I am the professor, Fernando Uribe. There's a lot to cover, so let's get started. This is what I'm thinking about right now in Hudson County. Well, folks, it was a very interesting article that came out in the Associated Press last week, coming out of Trenton. And more specifically, it sort of talks about the amount of money that school superintendents make throughout the Garden State, and even so much as a fact that there was previous legislation uh, in effect that talked about a salary cap for superintendents, but it, it seems like now the legislature is looking to eradicate it. And it's something that, quite frankly, you know what, when I, you know, and, and I'll give you a little bit of a, some information to sort of put it in the context before I, I sort of give you my opinion on this issue, but it seems last week, again, according to the Associated Press, that New Jersey lawmakers are considering eliminating a statewide cap on the salaries of school superintendents, which ultimately would allow school districts to set a higher pay and ultimately attract new applicants. Now, former Governor Chris Christie had instituted the cap back in 2011 to sort of lower school district budgets and to help drive down property taxes, which are the highest in the country. But some people across the state viewed the cap as a sort of political stunt that ultimately did not achieve its stated goal. Quote, as a matter of fact, an assemblywoman out of uh, South Jersey in Monmouth County, Assemblywoman Serena Damaso, went on to say maybe at the time it was the right thing to do to save taxpayers money, but in the current climate, we need, we need to do something different and something more, and this is ultimately it. And even this past Monday, the Assembly Education Committee in Trenton unanimously passed legislation to remove the cap. Now, the state Senate approved an identical bill this past February. But for example, there have been some differing notions about how to look at the salary cap implemented upon school superintendents. For example, Assemblywoman Myla Jassy, a Democrat out of Essex County, went on to say, who actually sponsored this bill specifically, said that the cap hurts school districts across the state who have had trouble attracting or retaining school leaders. Now, folks, let me just sort of give you a perspective here about what I think this legislation is about and where it's going. At the onset, listen, if, if for any of you that are in education, like I am, you know fully well that school superintendents in a multitude of school districts across the state make well over six figures, somewhere at the minimum of, of around $150,000 to almost capping out at $275,000. So that's a quarter of a million dollars for a school superintendent. Now, I don't want to sort of minimize the responsibilities. I mean, it, it deals with you know, formulating budgets, addressing personnel, dealing with, you know, sort of costs within a school district. So I'm not going to tell you here that, listen, it's an easy job. It certainly is very difficult. It's very time consuming. It can even be very laborious. But my issue isn't so much about the salary cap that has been implemented and, quite frankly, might get eliminated by the legislature and ultimately signed by Governor Murphy um, in Trenton, let's say, in the coming weeks. My issue really is the fact of who we're hiring in these positions. And listen, I get it as an educator. I'm very different than some of my friends across Hudson County, even across New Jersey, that teach at different levels. You know, especially, let's say, at the college level where I teach, yes, there's no certifications, there's no, there's, there's no sort of accreditation that I need to teach in higher education. Now, listen, that's certainly an advantage for me. I don't have to sort of waste extra money on coursework and, and tuition in the sense when it comes to any other qualifications that my position may merit. But when we're talking about teachers at the high school, middle school, and even elementary school level, yes, they all need certifications. They all need extra curriculum that they have to take. And listen, at the local level, certainly if you are looking to teach, but more so folks, if you're looking to get into an administrative position, whether it's a department supervisor, whether it's a principal, or even a superintendent. Folks, my issue, quite frankly, is the fact that the curriculum itself, I think, is honestly not even anywhere near as serious as real academic standards. And what I mean by that is, for example, if you're looking to be any sort of supervisor or, again, principal or superintendent, what you have to do is acquire an administration slash supervision graduate degree. And folks, honestly, again, I, I know I'm probably going to piss off some of my fellow teachers locally that I know, but folks, that curriculum is a joke. It really does a disservice because what we're doing is we're making it so easy to ascend to this level that we might, quite frankly, not be putting the best people in these positions. I mean, I've looked at this curriculum personally. For example, here locally at NJCU, you know what? They offer that curriculum and they also offer it at St. Peter's University. Now, listen, both excellent schools, wonderful, you know, academics, tons of great professors that I know that teach there, some not so much, you know, and especially at St. Peter's University, but that's sort of a topic for a different day. But the reality, folks, is that this curriculum is not difficult. And if you make it so easy to attain, what you're doing is you're sort of like devaluing these positions. You're devaluing this position that you may have. 
in terms of being, again, a supervisor, being a principal, or being a school superintendent. And you know what? I know sometimes some of my friends say, say to me, well, Fernando, you know, you're coming across very arrogant and very smug because you think your graduate degrees are more important than anyone else's. No, I'm not saying that. And granted, listen, as far as I'm concerned, when it comes to hiring good people in these positions, listen, I'm all a fan about hiring people with MBAs, you know, Masters in Business Administration, or an MPA, a Masters in Public Administration, or CPAs, Certified Public Accountants, or any other sort of combination of real reputable graduate degrees, whether it be in the social sciences, maybe even in the humanities, especially if we're talking about teaching in a school district. And folks, when we see this sort of easy curriculum, it's not difficult. And again, one of the things that really bothers me is the fact that, you know, it's become a joke. And if it's that easy to attain, what does it say about sort of like the prestige or the actual sort of integrity of the position? You're just giving it away to people on the fact of just getting any sort of, you know, graduate degree. And that's just not right. It does a disservice to the district and ultimately it does a disservice to students. And that's what I'm about. So let me be very clear again. I don't think putting a, a cap is a bad idea. I think we, you know, for the cost effectiveness of a district, absolutely. Let's make sure that we're not wasting money on these positions. Folks, a quarter of a million dollars is a lot of money to pay a school superintendent. You can sort of shave that off maybe and perhaps hire more teachers. But eliminating a cap altogether, I don't think that's a good idea. And also even getting to these positions, I think the curriculum should be much more difficult. Trust me, if you don't believe me, look it up yourself and trust me, you'll see it as easy as I'm telling you it is. So really, when we think about where superintendents should be hired and why they should be hired, let's not only just look at what we're paying them, but let's look at the criteria in which we're hiring them with. And that's what I'm thinking about right now in Hudson County. Well, folks, on the latest edition of Talk in the Hudson, which you listen to live every Wednesday night, live at 9 p.m. via www.blogtalkradio.com forward slash Talk in the Hudson, was the state senator of the 31st legislative district up here in Hudson County. And for those of you that are not aware, that encompasses all of Bayonne and the south side of Jersey City. It was my pleasure to welcome State Senator Sandra Cunningham to the program. Now, she had a lot to say with me on the air for over an hour, but here are some of the highlights that should catch your attention. First and foremost, we'll talk about sort of some of the advantages that constituents will now have in the 31st legislative district as it pertains to New Jersey Transit. There were some bus stops that were shut down due to budgetary reasons, but guess what? State Senator Cunningham, along with her assembly people in Trenton, were able to get New Jersey Transit on board and add additional stops specifically in the Greenville area. Let's see what she had to say about it. Uh, I know yourself and other um, leaders mm -hmm. in, in, in the 31st district have announced that New Jersey Transit will now be adding uh, Greenville yes. stops. I think that's mm -hmm. going to be a welcome relief for a lot of residents. Could you tell us a little bit more about what went into this process? Because I'm, I'm sure it wasn't just something that was done in two minutes. I'm sure it was very lengthy. Could you share that with us tonight? Uh, sure. You know, it took quite a while. Um, I, I will have to say that the two assembly people, so, uh, Shavarati and, uh, of course, um, Angela McKnight, and myself were able to work together with New Jersey Transit to get this issue straightened out. We've been going back and forth for several months. You know, there's a lot going on with, no, uh, with transit right now. But um, they promised us, you know, we couldn't come to a – we came to an agreement, but it was one that wasn't satisfying for all of us. However, um, they, being transit, agreed that they would continue to look and try to find a way to remedy the situation. And they were able to do it. So it's been going on for, I guess, since the beginning of the uh, almost – you know, we were notified, um, I guess, around the beginning of the year that there was going to be a change, and and it's been going back and forth. And um, Assemblywoman McKnight and Assemblyman Shevarati and I have met with them several times, and New Jersey Transit came to um, a budget meeting, and, you know, I'm on the budget committee committing for the Senate, and I asked them about it, and they really, uh, I give them a lot of credit because they gave us, um, they were serious and they took what we were saying seriously and they came up with something that wasn't good, but they didn't just throw in the towel at that point. So I'm just very, very happy. 
Without a doubt, this is going to be extremely beneficial to our constituents in the South Side, in Greenville, even along West Side Avenue, because you know what? A lot of working class people in Jersey City that need to get to work, need to get to school, and guess what? New Jersey Transit hopefully will make it a little bit easier for them in accomplishing these tasks and much, much more. Moving along, we talked about her perception of the current feud that exists between Governor Phil Murphy, the President of the State Senate, Steve Sweeney, and the Speaker of the General Assembly, Craig Coughlin. They're all Democrats, but as we discussed, they're very different type of de types of Democrats. Let's see what she had to say. Listeners tonight um, are very curious. I've gotten some emails off the air, some texts, and some, uh, some messages on Instagram and Facebook. Um, these are interesting times, Senator, for the Democratic Party in New Jersey. It seems like, um, I mean, I don't want to call him your boss, but certainly the leader in the state Senate, uh, Senate President Steve Sweeney and Governor Phil Murphy, uh, it, it, seems like, it seems like they're almost like the Yankees and Mets. They're, they're, not, they're never going to get along. It seems like they're never going to like each other. And it seems like right now, and, and I'm not just speaking as a journalist or a podcast host, or I'm, I'm talking just as a homeowner and taxpayer senator, these are very mm -hmm. different Democrats. These are very different Democrats, and just because there's a D next to their names, they could, as far as I'm concerned, I feel they could not be further apart on what it means to be a Democrat right now in New Jersey. And I think that's causing a lot of divide in Trenton, and I think it's causing a lot of divide in the party. I'm, I was, I was, again, I was looking forward to having you on tonight because I really want to get your thoughts about, I know you're a proud Democrat, but you have to be concerned about this sort of civil war within the Democratic Party in New Jersey, led by Governor Murphy, and then on the other side, I mean, to some extent, it's Assembly Speaker Coughlin, but it's really State Senate President Steve Sweeney. What are your thoughts about this war? Well, you know, first of all, I wouldn't describe it as a war. Um, I do okay. believe we have three very strong men with very strong personalities who are good Democrats, but how they see things are different. It doesn't mean that they're not good Democrats. It just means that they're going at things from a different perspective. I am not being a Pollyanna here, but I am telling you that I am confident when you have three men in the room, they basically want what's best for the state of New Jersey, and neither one of them will do anything to hurt New Jersey or its residents. So, you know, I, I'm confident that the budget is going to be signed and everything is going to uh, to work out. Is it going to be an easy process? Perhaps not. But what 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 does work out easily? I mean, this is our world here. It's always difficult. Um, but I think no, that uh, sure it will work through it. Now, we talked about marijuana reform. Now, certainly, as I've alluded to in previous episodes here of Talking Politics, back on March the 25th, there was actually a vote that was going to be held on both floors of the legislature, both in the chambers of the state assembly and also in the state senate. Subsequently, neither chamber had the necessary votes to sort of move forward, and the measure was ultimately tabled. And even recently, State Senate President Steve Sweeney said that for the rest of 2019, marijuana legalization in any capacity is going to be a dead issue. Well, Senator Cunningham had a lot to say about whether or not that's still feasible and, quite frankly, what direction we should be moving towards here in the Garden State as it pertains to not only decriminalization, but also recreational legalization here in New Jersey. But what was in the news cycle recently, and we, it, it did come up, well, it was supposed to come up for a vote in March, I believe March 25th, but it was tabled both in the Assembly and in the State Senate. There seems to be this conflict, Senator, about how to look at Marijuana decriminalization, I know your good friend and colleague, State Senator Ronald Rice, is very, very outspoken about this, and we'll get to him in a minute, because I really want to get your thoughts on him, but it just seems that on March 25th, it was tabled, it seems like the legislature just cannot be on board when it comes to decriminalization, and, and for a lot of New Jersey, that would be the important aspect of, rec you know, legalization of recreational marijuana, and I just want to get your thoughts on two things, A, I understand the legal argument. Now, I'm not an attorney. I mean, I, I'm an academic, and I sort of look at things academically as an uh -huh. educator. But, and I get it that, you know, when it comes to decriminalization and the concept of expungements, you know, a lot of arrest reports and a lot of case files for many years, Senator, you know, when you get arrested for possession, 
you know, mm-hmm. the amounts aren't ever, the, the amounts are not stipulated there. It's just simply mm-hmm. you're charged with a second degree, and that's it. And mm-hmm. there's no quantification about the amount. And I think that may be something that's sort of making this process frustrating. But it just seems like again, going back to the idea of you know, Democrats run the legislature. They have super majorities in the ha- in the mm-hmm. assembly and the state senate. Mm-hmm. And it just seems like even with something like decriminalization, which is so important, Senator. And I've talked about this mm-hmm. on the air with you before, you know, having worked in the criminal justice system for 10 years, I've seen firsthand what marijuana arrests have done to New Jersey yeah. residents, the most densely populated state. The, our, our prisons are overrun. And quite frankly, people of color, black and brown, are just That's unfortunately right. facing, are facing the wrath of these antiquated drug laws. But it just seems like the legislature – can't really get this right or even get on the same page. How frustrating is, is this for you currently? Well, it is very frustrating, but, you know, I I just did a piece of legislation that will change expungement, that will help with expungement with marijuana and with everything. Um, and I'm proud of this legislation. Uh, it passed uh, the Senate and I believe the Assembly. So that will be helpful. But, you know, like you you have to remember when Senator Rice is talking, and, and this is the difference. I believe that you can, marijuana is one of those issues that you can find enough people pro and con. There is enough evidence, you know, information that you could prove the point is good or the point is bad. You know what I mean? It's one of those topics that is just so much information. And a lot of the information, uh, some of it is good, some of it is bad, some of it crosses each other. So it's a rare case where, <clears throat> there, you know, there are just so many things going on. So you can find a case for anything. However, I do believe what Senator Rice has done and with people who are with him on this, we have to remember, you know, the African-American community has been a community in the past where alcohol was dropped on. We still haven't gotten out of that. We've been dealing with opiates longer than anybody else. It's never taken seriously. So I understand what he's saying. What he is saying is this is going to be another thing that's going to be dropped on the black and brown communities in the state of New Jersey. Um, And he has made a good case for it. And I think that there are a lot of people who have not made up their mind about marijuana. They haven't decided. You know, a lot of uh, we talk about we're hoping that poor people or poorer people, poorer in money, would be um, able to become, you know, own a dispensary or specifically what are they going to be able to do to make this something that uplifts the community. And um, that question still hasn't been answered fully. So I think that some people are just not sure. Um, There are older people who remember when it was called Mary Jane or whatever, and (laughs) they didn't think that, you know, it was a good idea then. So, um, I, you know, it's like anything else. You can't pull something out on people. You really have to give them an opportunity to uh, to study and to think about it and take their time to come to some conclusion. I still believe that um, it will probably pass eventually because, you know, if our surrounding areas, which we're always competing with, New York, Brooklyn, Philadelphia, if they have it, then it would be to our economic disadvantage not to. But I understand people's, you know, reservations. It takes a while to get hold of something. I mean, I'll give you an example. Ever since that I've been a senator, I've been going to schools, and I always tell kids, don't take drugs. So now I'm, you know, even I think about, well, what will you say when you go to school? Uh, to visit kids now and take drugs, other, you know, other than marijuana, and that's not going to work. So, I mean, it's something that we're all working with and working at, but 
you know, I'm appreciative for what Senator Rice and um, his uh, followers or people who are with him on this because they're really bringing the question and opening it up to a wider audience, and I think that that's what we need. Lastly, Senator Cunningham prides herself on being a reformer, more specifically within our own criminal justice system here in the state of New Jersey, something that she's very adamant about, along with her colleague in the state Senate, Senator Ronald Rice out of Essex County, is the ability to sort of restore voting rights for not only those that have exited our criminal justice system, but even for those that are currently incarcerated. As we know, it's a very controversial topic within the Democratic Party, and it seems to be dividing the party on a daily basis. What's the criteria that we should look at? Should we have some of the most heinous among us that are currently serving life sentences still having the right to vote, or even less serious offenders. She talked about her, her thoughts about whether or not inmates should be able to vote, and quite frankly, the criteria that we need to keep implementing when it comes to restoring voting rights for those that have fulfilled their sentences and are trying to be productive back in society. Let's see what she had to say about this. But Senator, for even someone like me, how can you convince a re any reasonable Middle of the road American or New Jerseyan, for that matter, that someone as heinous as the Boston Marathon bomber, or ch ch you know child molesters or serial killers that are currently incarcerated, how can you sell them and us the fact that even those type of despicable people should still have the right to vote while currently incarcerated? What's your argument when you hear someone say? Senator Cunningham, are you kidding me? My God, these are the most reprehensible people in our society. How can you even allow them to vote? What's your answer? Uh, well, I, okay, there's a couple of things. First of all, I do have a piece of legislation that says that they can, whether you're in incarceration now, you're on probation, you're on parole, you have the right to vote. And I'm on that legislation with Senator Rice and in the assembly with uh, Senator Shavonda Sumter. Uh, we're supporting this. But let me just explain you. Here, here, here is one of the, the fallacies of our system. Once you have served your time, once you are serving your time, whatever it is that you have done, you should not. Are we telling people you serve your time and you still, for the rest of your life, will be treated? like a criminal, different. That doesn't make sense to me. If you're going to treat people like they're criminals and, they, and, and never give them a foot up, a hand up, because they once got in trouble, whatever reprehensible act they did, then I don't understand why we punish people at all. Why put, incarcerate them? It doesn't mean anything. And the other thing to remember, and people think, oh, my God, if this happens, every prisoner in the world is going to want to vote and people are going to be running around. Only the people who have decided and truly decide in their mind and their heart that they want to be treated as productive citizens are going to want to vote. Everyone that is incarcerated is not even going to care. The majority of them won't care. But those who do should have that right. The 15th Amendment says that, you know, this is an unalienable right to vote. And what harm does it do to allow them to vote? You know, part of the, the problem that I have with the justice system in this country is we warehouse mm -hmm. people. We can't warehouse, continue to warehouse people. And then when their time is up, we send them home and we treated them. We haven't given them dignity or given them respect or given them the tools to turn their lives around. So this bill is very, very important to me. The governor campaigned on it himself. Uh, when he was running, I was in several audiences when he did, and it's a difficult piece of bill. I know that Senator Cory Booker is now trying to do it on the federal level, but this mm -hmm. is very, very important. Certainly, Senator Cunningham had a lot to say during this hour-plus-long interview.
And of course, these are some of the most pertinent topics, but to listen to the entire audio, you can always go to www.blogtalkradio.com forward slash talk in the Hudson. You can listen to it from any PC, Mac, smartphone, or tablet anywhere at any time. Again, she's very adamant about the issues that matter most to her, not only for the 31st Legislative District, but for New Jerseyans all across the state. So it was great having her on, and certainly we appreciate her being a regular on my weekly podcast. Folks, on to some local stories now, and one that really I think should sort of all make us feel good today, especially all the ladies in Hudson County. It's my pleasure to tell you today that the Township of North Bergen just swore in their first ever Latina captain to the police department. Not only is it a momentous occasion for females, not only in North Bergen, but throughout Hudson County, as Cynthia Montero is now the first Latina police captain of any municipal police department. Now, let me just say this, though, because I know Cynthia personally, having worked uh, in the judiciary many years ago as a probation officer, I worked with Cynthia back at the administration building at 595 Newark Avenue in Jersey City. And I knew right from the moment I met her that Cynthia was someone who was hands-on, very assertive, but also a very sort of gracious individual. And you know what, when I think about women not only accomplishing these feats in law enforcement, academia, in any sort of profession, it should make you feel good. And especially, it should make you feel even better when it happens to good people. And that's quite frankly what Cynthia Montero is. So again, just sort of looking at some, some points here, you know, North Bergen recently promoted 15 veteran officers to supervisory positions at a ceremony this past week. And of course, as I said, longtime department leader Cynthia Montero sworn in as the first ever Hudson County's Latina police captain. And you know what? I think it's a momentous occasion for women in law enforcement, not just here in North Bergen, but throughout Hudson County and also throughout the state of New Jersey. I'm glad that North Bergen is sort of setting the precedent for law enforcement, especially for females, as they continue to join the ranks and contribute to this profession. So congratulations to Captain Cynthia Montero of the North Bergen Police Department. Honestly, it's well-deserved. And you know what? When we think about people that join law enforcement, we think about people like Cynthia Montero, who want to do good for the community, who want to help people, who want to enforce the law, but most importantly, want to ensure that the quality of life for all residents remains intact and it continues to improve on a daily basis. So congrats to her and congrats to the North Bergen Police Department. It's a job well done. Well, folks, thank you so much for watching this week. For all the excellent programming offered by the Hudson Media Group, you can always go to www.hmgtvshows.com and also www.livestream.com forward slash hmgtv. To listen to Talk in the Hudson, you can do so by going to www.blogtalkradio.com forward slash Talk in the Hudson from any PC, Mac, smartphone, or tablet. Listen to it anywhere at any time. Don't forget to follow the show on Instagram. Also, follow me on Facebook and Twitter. And also make sure you check out all the excellent programming and follow the Hudson Media Group on all of their social media platforms. Folks, I want to take this opportunity to wish you all a very happy Father's Day weekend to my dad, to my uncle, to all the dads doing the right thing every day by their kids, whether you're there, you're working, whatever it is you're doing. Shout out to all the dads this Father's Day weekend. Do something nice for dad because quite frankly, Father's Day should be every day. Thank you so much again for watching, folks, here. If we're talking politics, we're doing it right here with the Hudson Media Group. I'm Fernando Uribe. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to catch Fernando's podcast at blogtalkradio.com slash talkonthehudson. New episodes available every Wednesday night at 9 p.m.